Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Health to my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for Monday, March the 22nd. We're honored to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen-speaking people, the Songhees, and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday, we'll be preparing uh, briefings for 3 o'clock, written briefings at approximately 3 o'clock with relevant information about the COVID-19 pandemic in British Columbia. We'll be back here, here uh, briefing from the Press Theatre in Victoria on Thursday. And with that, it's my honour to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, so today we have uh, three periods to report on. Uh, between uh, Friday and Saturday, we had 556 new cases reported here in British Columbia. Saturday to Sunday, an additional 598 uh, people were diagnosed with COVID-19. And then from yesterday to today, another 631 people. This is 1,700 and uh, 85 new people diagnosed with COVID-19 across the province, two of whom were epidemiologically linked, bringing the total number of people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 to 92,571 in British Columbia since this pandemic started. Of the new cases, 469 are in Vancouver Coastal Health, 1,010 were in the Fraser Health Authority, 89 people were in the Vancouver Island Health Authority, 84 people in the Interior Health Authority and 133 people live in the Northern Health Authority. So that brings us up to 5,290 active cases in all areas of the province and 303 of whom are in hospital right now, 80 people in critical care or ICU. We also have uh, 9,330 people under active public health monitoring and uh, 85,746 uh, people who have recovered from their acute illness. Uh, we've had, sadly, another 16 people who have died from COVID-19 since our last report. One of these was a historical death that was reclassified over the weekend and 15 new deaths, bringing the total number of people who have died in British Columbia to 1,437. As we continue to make our way through this last phrase, stage of the pandemic, we remember every day the families and the care providers and the communities who have lost loved ones and our thoughts are with you during this challenging time. We have no new health care outbreaks and the outbreaks have been declared over at the Florentine in Interior Health and Chilliwack General Hospital as well. So that leaves us with four active outbreaks in long-term care assisted living or independent living and seven in acute care units around the province. We have also on the weekend had an increase in uh, uh, confirmed cases that have been identified as having variants of concern. Um, 166 new cases have been retrospectively identified for a total of 1,366 cases uh, in the province. 237 of them are active cases currently and the remaining people have uh, are past their acute phase. Uh, the, the predominant uh, variant of concern that we continue to see is the B117 associated with the UK and we have 1,240 cases that have been identified with that, um, that variant. They are primarily in the Fraser Valley, or sorry, the Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health Region. In addition, we've had, we continue to have 41 South African cases, uh, the B1351, with no new cases of that variant. Um, but we have had an increase in the P1, the variant that's associated with Brazil, another 20 cases in two clusters have been identified. So uh, we now have 1,047 of these cases are in the Fraser Health Region, 276 in Vancouver Coastal. We remain low on the island in the north, we're 8 and 5 respectively, and we now have another uh, 10 cases in Interior Health, bringing the total there to 30. 
Um, one of the things that we follow very carefully is whether the uh, variants that we're seeing are, are having an increase in hospitalization or an increased risk of death. And so far, we are not seeing that. There are currently 23 people who have been identified as having a variant case in hospital, but our overall hospitalization rate remains the same as what we're seeing or slightly less than what we're seeing in the general population, around 5%. And we have not seen an increase in deaths either. As you know, this has been a, a week of ramping up of our immunization programs on several different fronts. And we've delivered over 539,408 doses of all three COVID-19 vaccines in BC. Um, this puts us ahead of the schedule that we had originally um, been on based on uh, what we were expecting to receive. And as we talked about last week, uh, the fact that we now have three safe and effective vaccines and uh, that we're able to use in several different strategies has meant that we can move up our age-based strategy again this week. Uh, there's some, been some, um, as well, uh, very positive news that's recently been released around the AstraZeneca COVID Shield vaccine with a recent trial that we've all been waiting for from the United States. Uh, uh, just uh, the numbers being released, and it shows that the effectiveness or the efficacy in the trial of the AstraZeneca vaccine was 79% uh, putting it right up there in league uh, with the, the Pfizer Moderna vaccines that we're seeing as well. And this is very good news. There were concerns that many uh, of the regulators had expressed about the previous trials and when they had been done and, and how they were run. Um, and this one is one that we know the US FDA has been waiting on. And it's very positive news. We want to see all the details, of course. Um, but two important things. One is that the um, effect, uh, efficacy for um, even mild illness is very high. And it's even higher, uh, close to 100%, similar to what we saw with the Pfizer and Moderna clinical trials against hospitalization and severe illness. So this is really good news for us. Um, this is uh, one of our the other challenges that we've been um, uh, working on and following, of course, around the world is the immunization surveillance for, for safety signals. And that is something that we do here very um, meticulously here in BC. And we are part of a worldwide uh, safety monitoring for the adverse effects from following immunization. We now have uh, uh, 497 APHES reported in British Columbia, and all of these have been investigated. 50 of them were related to anaphylaxis or allergic reactions. And uh, these continue to be monitored and uh, treated and making sure that everybody who's providing immunization knows how to respond to somebody with an allergic reaction. Um, of importance, though, we have not detected any other safety signals um, similar to what was seen, for example, in Europe. We continue to monitor the safety signals from around the world. And we are reassured by the investigation that the uh, European Medicines Agency did, and that was done in Germany, um, that clotting remains extremely rare. And with um, vaccinations in the millions being given out around the world. We know that uh, the benefits of this vaccine far outweigh any risk of blood clotting. And the minimal risk um, with that we see from any of the vaccines compared to the risk that we get from infection with COVID-19. And I think this is important for us all to continue to follow. If we know that this uh, virus can cause clotting, we've seen it, the histories of blood clots, of heart attacks, of pulmonary embolus, pulmonary blood clots and strokes from infection with COVID-19 remains very high and a very real risk. And the benefits that we have with all three of the vaccines that are available here in BC far outseed any um, risk um, from infection. I'd like to speak for a moment about how we are using the vaccines here in BC. We talked last uh, week about the two parallel programs that we have. So the AstraZeneca uh, COVID Shield vaccine program is a parallel track. 
it augments the mainstay of our program, which is the 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 uh, Pfizer and Moderna age-based risk program that we've now been able to also move up so that people in their 70s are now uh, eligible for appointments and are getting vaccinated. And I encourage us all to support the older people in our lives, our aunties, our uncles, our friends, to be able to get in and to get the, their vaccine in a timely way as soon as we can. In the parallel track, we, uh, we have, uh, it allows us to be more flexible in, in dealing with where we are seeing outbreaks in our community now and addressing those hot, hot spots and those high risk areas so that we can protect workers and in turn protect our communities. We're using this vaccine with the local medical health officers and making decisions about where we are seeing risk and outbreaks and clusters right now to provide protection to frontline workers and those working and living in higher risk settings where we have seen repeatedly transmission can be high and it spills over into our, our homes, into our communities. Protecting these groups provides greater protection to all of us. It's addressing that transmission that we're continuing to see in the community. And this dual prong approach, we've been able to accelerate on both fronts. And I recognize many people are eager to get their vaccine as quickly as possible, and it's not always clear why someone else is getting a vaccine ahead of you. It is important to remember that doing it this way, putting out those hot spots in those um, areas that we are seeing outbreaks happen, protects all of us and increases all of our protection and moves us all that bit further along the queue. While more and more people are getting vaccinated every day, it's very important that the risk for all of us remains high. And we see that in our seven-day rolling average. We see that in the increasing that we've seen over the last few weeks. You know, we ask about whether we're in a third wave. It really is. We've come down from the peak of our second wave, but we have leveled out for many weeks now. And it's a slow and steady increase. Concerningly, we're starting to see younger people who are being affected end up in hospital and needing hospital and ICU care, and that is concerning. At the same time, we're having more and more people protected by these vaccines, but we do not yet have enough protection to keep us all safe. In particular, we've seen this increase being focused in uh, the Lower Mainland in particular, and people in hospital and in ICU in the Lower Mainland. This is a concern because, as we know, that is where the highest population density is, and this type of an increase can quickly get out of control, and that is something we don't want when we're at this phase of the pandemic. We know these escalating new cases have been connected to, to two main events, so people who are getting exposed and clusters in workplaces and in homes. We know now it's so so challenging at this point after going through our, our the last year of this pandemic and being at that place where we want so much to be with our families with our friends and we know that people are gathering together indoor spaces what i can say is we know that the b117 variant is more transmissible it's much easier to spread it with even minimal contact in indoor settings. The areas where we know it spreads most, uh, most quickly and most dangerously are the same as they were last year, but now there's even less a margin for error. So that close contact, when we're inside, when we let our guard down, when we're talking in close contact with people where the ventilation isn't as good, those are the times when this virus can spread even more quickly. Indoor gatherings of any size continue to be a risk. The only safe place for us to gather now with our small groups, with our friends, with our family, is outside. And that's why we need to focus on the things that we can do together in those groups of up to 10 outside where the, we don't give this virus a chance to spread. Our grandparents, uncles and aunties, and cousins and friends who are older are still at risk of severe illness. This means that if you are thinking about spring weddings, birthday parties, other occasions, we need to push them to the summer. 
This is a time where we need to take those little sacrifices, all of us, so that we can continue to keep those important workplaces open. We can continue to support our children to be in school. And we can continue to support our immunization programs so that we can all be safe very soon. And for businesses, I also want to be clear. You must continue to have COVID safety plans, regardless of whether you've been vaccinated or employees have been vaccinated. It takes time for that to come into effect, and it takes time when we have this much transmission in our community. And we will, and we know that is happening around the province, take all necessary steps, including closing businesses where we're seeing ongoing transmission, if that is required, for at least 10 days. So for all of us, don't let up now. And if you are blatantly disregarding those public health orders, there are ramifications for that. For those anticipating an easing of restrictions, as I mentioned last week on religious gatherings, we have, uh, we're working on the final touches of amending uh, the, the variants for outdoor religious gatherings um, based on the advice that I gratefully received from many faith leaders last week. And that will be coming in the next um, day or so. So the variants of concern are moving quickly. It makes it more difficult for us to have that leeway to do the things that are risky. To counter that, we continue to be slow and steady and to find our balance, our path to get to those brighter days which are not that far away now. So let's make spring, this next three months, the time to be outside, to ha gather with people that we care for safely and to remember to connect with all of our friends and family online. This is a very challenging time for people and we know that those connections make a difference. But do them safely. Continue to use our safety layers, washing hands, wearing masks, keeping a safe distance from others and always, always staying home if we're not well. The COVID-19 pandemic is still with us. But there are post-pandemic days ahead. We are not quite yet through this storm. So as we use our momentum and our vaccination programs and the things that we know work to push us forward, let's continue to be kind and to be calm and to be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And I wanted to start by um, um, passing on my condolences uh, to the 16 families, friends of caregivers, the family, friends and caregivers of the 16 people who passed away in British Columbia. Related to COVID-19 this weekend, nine from Friday to Saturday, four from Saturday to Sunday, three from Sunday to Monday, 10 of whom lived in the Fraser Health Authority, five in the Northern Health Authority, one in the Interior Health Authority. Uh, this is an extraordinarily difficult time. Dr. Henry talked about uh, and we've had this experience and we've talked to people and they've engaged with us about the challenges these days of celebrations of life, of funerals, and limiting them to a small group of people. And that is true everywhere, which means that we have to find ways when our loved ones are grieving, because we know that for every loss of life, there are many, many people who are grieving. And we have to find ways to support them in these difficult times. And I want to, all of those families to know that we are with them today. There are um, 303 people in hospital today, 80 in ICU. And just to put that in context, uh, that means our, uh, our base bed capacity in acute care is at 89.4% at the moment. Our, with our surge beds, the ones we are adding that are available to us, 71.1% is the level of capacity in critical care. That's 75.8% and 53.6% counting surge beds. So that's 991 base uh, acute care beds and 129 ICU beds. That said, obviously there is more significant cases of, of hospitalizations in Fraser Health and it is very challenging for everyone in our hospital system and we have to do everything we can to support them. I wanted to note uh, uh, with respect to our immunization campaign, as of yesterday, 40,213 uh, people in British Columbia, over 90, have now been immunized. There are, are as you'll remember, about 50,000 people over 90 in the province, which shows extraordinary progress with those group of people already receiving their first dose 
of COVID-19 vaccine, 41,377 between 85 and 89. We know there's about 72,000 people in that category and 40,387 between 80 and 84. There are about 120,000 people in that category. So that's about 122,000 in total uh, uh, people over 80 who have been immunized against COVID-19 in BC. And uh, at this point in the campaign, and as Dr. Henry has said, that we are working ahead of what we had scheduled to do in our age-based campaign. I'd also note that as of yesterday, uh, of the Pfizer vaccine, 420, 412,466 doses have been given out of 426,660 that have been distributed to health authorities, which is, uh, means that we were right up to the edge of our Pfizer. Fortunately, more has come today. And 116,239 of the 136,000 doses of Moderna have also been uh, provided in BC. So we, we have been using the vaccine in our age-based campaign that we've been receiving. And, uh, and I say that that's really remarkable given the challenges of such a large province, really a remarkable effort by our health authorities across BC. As well, 10,753 uh, doses of AstraZeneca have been provided already as we get started with that effort in BC. I just want to say um, finally that this is um, a really challenging moment that the vaccines, of course, provide us with a great deal of hope. But the orders are still in place and gathering indoors is a major problem in British Columbia and continues to be with respect to COVID-19. If you are thinking of going out for a birthday celebration or someone invites you to a wedding celebration somewhere, do not go right now. And that includes organizing them from the point of view of a restaurant and so on. It means that you should only gather with people indoors, with people in your household. That continues to be the case. And with these case numbers, we have to recognize the necessity of that right now. It is particularly important in Metro Vancouver, but as we've seen in the course of this pandemic, it matters everywhere in BC. The number of us who received our first dose of vaccine from the supply available is 10.5% of the 4.3 million people eligible. 10.5% is progress. It's in advance of where we thought we'd be at this point, but nonetheless, it's 10.45%. I think what everyone sees and understands is that right now in our BC pandemic, we are in a challenging time. Many of the other indicators, ones that we all know are important and that right now must matter to us all, are still too high or worse, moving in the wrong direction. Hospitalizations, people in ICU, daily infections, seven-day weekly average, COVID variant cases, people in self-isolation, BC's active cases are all too high, all too high right now. We are all excited about getting our shot about getting our turn. But COVID doesn't care about vaccine optimism. It lives to spread and it spreads to live. That's it. And right now the living is too easy for COVID-19 in BC. Our pandemic ha experience has taught us that there's no point getting into a staring contest with COVID-19 because COVID-19 never blinks ever. And right now, this moment, our BC pandemic reality is telling us that there's no point thinking everyone's safe because there's vaccine, because it's almost our time for our shot or even because we've had our shot. COVID-19 just doesn't care because it's all around us. We need to stick to what we know, what we know works, which is follow public health guidance and follow public health orders. And at this moment, at this moment in the pandemic, that is more important than ever. Aujourd'hui, nous faisons le point sur le nombre de nouveaux cas pour trois périodes de référence de 24 heures chacune, soit celle du 19 et 20 mars, ce du 20 mars et 21 mars, et ce du 21 mars jusqu'au 22 mars en mi-journée. Il y a eu 16 nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 durant ces trois périodes de référence. Nous offrons nos condoléances aux familles et aux amis des 1437 personnes décédées du COVID-19 et à tous ceux qui ont perdu des êtres chers au cours de cette pandémie. Pour la première période de référence, nous avons eu 556 nouveaux cas. Pour la deuxième période de référence, nous avons eu 598 nouveaux cas. Au cours des dernières 24 heures, nous avons eu 631 nouveaux cas. Euh, parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, euh, 303 personnes sont actuellement, actuellement hospitalisées, dont 80 en soins intensifs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. 
Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to reporters on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up only. First question today is from Martella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix. Um, it, it's obvious that you both have been saying now that this is a very challenging time and that people just don't seem to be listening to you when you're saying don't gather indoors. What What are the consequences or what are um, the impact that you can further impose to try to make people get this message because it doesn't seem to be working right now. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of different parts to it, and and it has it has been a bleak winter, and it's um it's been hard for everybody. But we are into a hopeful spring, and you know, now that we are into spring, we need to focus on the things we can do. And we need to go back and think again about how we can do things safely. And at this point, more than ever, to protect each other. So yes, there's lots of things we can do outside right now. Go outside and play, as I've been saying all along. Those are the things we need to think about. Um, and those are things that we can do safely. We have heard that some people are are planning uh, celebrations and parties and w weddings and other things in the near future. And really, we need to remember that we are not out of this woods yet. We cannot be thinking about those things. And we in public health will be uh, taking a concerted effort with our partnerships with WorkSafe BC to make sure that we are um, holding establishments to account for their safety plans and for things that they're doing because we know that it puts their own um, relatives, or their, sorry, their own employees at risk as well as the people who are coming to these places. So there's a number of things that we are, are working on, but we are going to be consistently. We've talked about you know, what, what types of things can we do um, that will make a difference and where we're seeing transmission. Some of them is really important. We've um, talked about it a bit. Part of it is through our immunization, but also our outbreak management and having vaccines, particularly the AstraZeneca vaccine, gives us another tool in part of our outbreak management. And we've seen that in action. It works, but it also takes time. And it means that right now you cannot let up on those COVID safety plans. But we are also seeing transmission in, in event uh, in that spills over into um, places in our community, whether it's restaurants and pubs or gyms or some of the other uh, social settings, um, even we've seen uh, clusters related to um, some uh, of the youth sports settings. Again, not the kids so much, but in the fa the adults and the parents who are around those settings. We're also focusing our attention on where we know the risk is highest, and that's the areas where uh, that the transmission in the community is highest. And it may not be a large number of people, but if I'm uh, somebody who's working in a high-risk uh, environment and I go home and I live in a, in a crowded house or a house with multi-generational families, big families, which is really wonderful and exciting, my risk right now of passing that to people in my household is much higher than it was a few months ago. So we're trying to tackle it at all different parts. And people need to understand that. And we will be out um, making sure that businesses who are part of this whole um, uh, this whole um, transmission chains right now are part of that as well. Marcella, do you have a follow-up? If I could ask, and I know, I know there was some mention of this earlier, but with 60 new deaths recorded over the weekend, can you explain if they're not happening in care homes, where are these people dying? And not necessarily geographically, but what are the age groups of these people? Because you have mentioned that younger people are getting sick now. So if you can kind of break down how is it possible that 16 more lives have been lost? Yeah, and the, there has been uh, two of the deaths were related to uh, um, outbreaks that are now over in long-term care, but um, somebody uh, has passed away, and COVID is part of the reason. They may no longer have been infectious, but it may have been the thing that tipped them over the edge. But what we're seeing is people in our community, younger age groups, are requiring hospitalization and needing to be in hospital for longer periods of time. And it is those people who are now dying from this. We have seen several young people in their 30s and 40s who have unfortunately critically um, been severely affected by COVID. And this is one of the things we are working 
now. I've been trying to get the data from our team to put together around age of hospitalization. It still, of course, is riskier the older you are. But as we are protecting more and more older people, we're also seeing uh, risk in younger people. And younger people are ending up in the ICU and needing uh, ICU care for a longer period of time. But we will have some more statistics on that a little bit later this week. Next question is from Shannon Patterson, CTV. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. A Surrey Elementary School teacher who has COVID-19 uh, has been admitted to the ICU now, and that has teachers in Surrey understandably worried as they prepare to return from spring break in a week. Considering the high COVID case numbers in schools in Surrey, will teachers in the Surrey School District be given vaccine priority uh, compared to teachers in districts that have seen fewer COVID cases? Yeah, so we are working through that with my colleagues, as we mentioned last week. Uh, you know, we are prioritizing where we need to pay attention. And as we get more vaccine, we've heard uh, we'll be getting more AstraZeneca vaccine, hopefully in the next week. We will be targeting uh, the priority groups that we mentioned last, uh, uh, that are for the next phase. And uh, absolutely, we're looking at a whole bunch of things around the communities where risk is highest. And Surrey is the highest in the province. Uh, uh, Rupert was one of the high ones. We were able to do a, a whole of community approach. Um, we're now looking at uh, different uh, communities around the province, but Surrey by far has been for some time in the highest risk area. So we are looking at several different strategies, including immunization of people in the education system, but also targeting businesses and some of the communities. So we're doing the work right now to see if we can understand best um, where the communities are most at risk and making sure that if they're older people, they're into the age-based program, making sure we're bringing the immunization programs to the communities and that access is not an issue. So those are things that we've been working over this past weekend. We did quite a lot of, of looking at this. So yes, we will be strategically targeting um, communities where transmission is highest. And the flexibility of the AstraZeneca vaccine allows us to do that, whether it's a workplace, whether it's uh, the school setting. Um, and yes, we'll be prioritizing. As you know, we don't have enough vaccine to do everybody in the school system right now. So we will be prioritizing by where the risk is greatest. Follow up, Ben? Yeah. Um, technically, according to the websites, people who turn 75 uh, this year are not eligible for the vaccine or to call for their appointment until Thursday. But we are hearing that uh, people who are 74, 75 are already getting appointments. Apparently, it's all the talk among seniors that you can call now and get an appointment before you technically qualify. Is that true? And if so, isn't that a little confusing if what uh, you guys are advertising isn't actually true? You know what? We are trying to be as efficient as we can. And so yes, in many cases, if uh, if it's a couple and there's somebody who's in that age and and somebody who's within, you know, a very short um, eligibility period, some places are able to do that. And if there's appointments available, we're moving them up. So uh, yes, we're seeing that it's it's working. People are being very respectful of this, which is great. It means things up um, in certain areas more than uh, be the nature of the population and the number of people are dealing with. Did you want to talk about that? Yeah. But uh, just to say today, it's people um, who are 78 uh, today, so that's uh, 1943 or before. Uh, who are eligible, and uh, tomorrow it will be, I believe, t tomorrow will be 77, so it will be 1944. There are some parts of the province, remember, and some parts of health authorities where we're taking a more all of community approach. So it may well be that in a community such as Port Renfrew, obviously Prince Rupert, but there are other communities where we're going in and doing the whole community. You're seeing someone, some people who are younger than. Uh, then 78 get the vaccine, or you know, as in today, or get their appointments, or younger than 80. Uh, in fact, in the Northern Health 30, where we do, uh, where we're doing more of an all of community approach, Northern Health is ahead of the other health authorities between 80 and 84, but behind the health, other health authorities between 90 and above. And so you're seeing some regional differences in that. But I really encourage people to, to follow what we're, uh, the directions are, which are. 
um, uh, 78 uh, right now, as of today, as of noon today. And then it'll come down, and you can see that it's coming down on a regular basis and that people are getting their appointments. About 80% of those people over 90 have actually received their vaccine already, which is, uh, I think, a very positive sign for the age cohorts behind them. And we're really asking people to follow those directions. There will be cases sometimes where uh, for a variety of reasons people may get around that, but we'd like people uh, to stick to what we've said. And uh, we're going to be working hard to make sure that uh, uh, the, the vaccine is applied across the board in a fair way. But sometimes, and there, ha there are occasions when there have been people who have come with someone or been around who have got access to the vaccine, but it's our intention to stick as closely uh, to those rules as we can noting that we have already said there are going to be exceptions to those rules for different regions of the province. Next question is from Camille Baines, Canadian Press. With people who've already had, had COVID-19, uh, should they be getting only one dose of a vaccine because of their antibody levels and would those be tested? The level of numbers small, so you're not risking that transmission that will lead to somebody else ending up in hospital. Next question is from Richard Zisman, Global News. I want to go back to the issue that Shannon was raising. For those that are 75 or 76 who are fortunate enough to get an appointment, can you explain first off how that happened? I, I want to talk specifically, I know you'll say that there's different regions, I want to talk specifically about Fraser Health. But in Fraser Health, we know that there are some 75 and 76-year-olds who got vaccination appointments before it was their scheduled timeline. So how did that even happen? Is there an assurance that it will no longer happen? Or what does this say to sort of opening up for those in Fraser Health when they can actually get their vaccine? You know, why would we stop something that moves people up? You know, this is happening very rarely. Yes, it happens. Maybe somebody is over the age of 70 and their partner. And you know what? If there's appointments available, we want to fill them. This is not a, a big conspiracy or anything evil, okay? Most people are doing the right thing. It means that the, the situation is smooth. The time that people are online is is limited. Um, they're getting their appointments. The appointments are very efficient, and they're, we're tracking the appointments to match the vaccine that we have. So there are slight differences in different parts of the province, as we know, um, until we move to our, our seamless system. But uh, this is not something that's happening a lot. This is something that uh, occasionally happens, and it's a good thing. It means that more people are moving up the line. But we're not seeing, there have been some occasions where people have, uh, who are not even in their 70s, for example, have tried to book appointments and, and their, their appointments are cancelled or they're, if they arrive at a clinic, they're told that they're not eligible. So we have systems in place. Most people are following the rules and we are very grateful for that. That means it's a smooth experience for everybody. I don't know if you want to say anything about it. Uh, I think we're, we're uh, I think overwhelmingly people are following the rules uh, Richard and uh, you know we've had uh, 540,000 uh, shots delivered and when people call up they provide their date of birth and they say they're in the cohort and they provide they need to provide their personal health number and other information and then they receive an appointment and there have been a number of cases of course when appointments have been canceled when people have been outside of that or they're misinformed or or, or whatever, but uh, that's a lot of uh, lot of immunizations, uh, uh, and uh, right now uh, about 10.5 percent of the population immunized, about 80 percent of those over 90 immunized. So uh, to date, it's been working. We've been a we've been able to assure that in our age-based uh, effort that we're moving through uh, age cohorts, and I think you can see that happening every day. And I think there'll be a dramatically lower desire of, of anyone to want to try and move up. When they see the progress that we're making day on day by day, um, down the 79, then today 78, then 77, and so on through the cohorts. And on uh, Saturday, for example, 33,000 people booked their appointments on a Saturday. That was when we opened up to people age 79. So there may be uh, some exceptions to that. We're asking people to follow uh, what we're doing because that means it's fair for everybody. 
And I think overwhelmingly that's the case. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some cases where people may get it um, a few days before they would otherwise have got it. And as Dr. Henry has said, that's not the end of the world. Richard, do you have a follow-up? I do. I wasn't suggesting there was a conspiracy theory, but you keep saying a majority of people are following the rules. So is the rule that you can only call in on your birth year and if you don't call in your birth year, uh, how is it possible that people get appointments? Like, I, I'm, I think there is some, and maybe this is happening to very few people, but there still seems to be confusion. And if you're a 75 year old in Fraser Health, if you call right now to get your appointment, uh, what should you be told? Yeah, you know, we have an age base and we, we've tried to gate it by year, as you say. But I remind you what we've been saying all along. You don't always know another person's story. There are other reasons why people may have got appointments. We have been talking about people who are clinically, excuse me, extremely vulnerable and how we've been reaching out to some of those categories as well. And the vast majority of people are, are doing what we've asked them to do. And that means that it's efficient for everybody. Next question is from Jane Side, North Shore News. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, I also have, um, not surprisingly, some questions um, about vaccines. Now, last week it was announced that certain um, frontline priority groups would be getting the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, and teachers uh, appear to make up a large portion of those frontline workers. Um, we've been told all along that transmission in schools has been low. So I'm just wondering, have teachers been contracting uh, COVID in schools in greater numbers than we were first led to believe, or have teachers been um, passing the virus along to students um, in greater numbers than we first thought, or is there another um, scientific reason for prioritizing teacher, teachers in that group? Yeah, no, we are not seeing uh, transmission in greater numbers. We know that the safety plans in schools are working, and we see that in the low rates of transmission in the school setting. But the school setting is reflective of the community, and we do know when we have higher rates in the community, there's exposures that happen in schools, and we've been seeing that. And it's been um, particularly uh, a concern in the Surrey Health, uh, the Surrey um, School District. And when we see exposures in schools, it's very disruptive. It's disruptive because people have to self-isolate, people have to, the close contact, and sometimes the whole cohort has to go uh, to work from home or to have schooling from home. And that is disruptive to families. It's disruptive to the education of, our, of the children. So yes, um, teachers are, well, all of the educators in the school system are part of our priority group um, because of the role that they play in supporting the education system and how disruptive it is when we have exposure events given the high rates of transmission in our community. So it's very similar uh, to why we are um, uh, prioritizing uh, police services, fire services, um, our emergency medical services, not because they're at high risk, but because they have an important function in society that can be disrupted and disrupted quite severely if we start to get clusters and people have to be uh, self-isolating. So it's, a, it's part of reciprocity as well. Um, making sure that we are able to support people who cannot work from home. And that's why it is also looking at some of the higher risk environments where we do see transmission and outbreaks. So it's a balancing of a number of different factors um, that, that has made that list. And as you know, that list is not exhaustive. Um, and as more vaccine is available, we'll be looking at additional opportunities to, to immunize people to protect them in their workplaces as well. Jane, do you have a follow-up? Um, I do, um, also on the topic of vaccines. Um, in terms of the end of the day for some of these clinics, I'm wondering if there's any kind of um, process that uh, people are expected to use for sort of using up the last doses um, at the end of the day if maybe they've gone through appointments. We've been hearing some sort of anecdotal reports that, you know, people have like yelled across the street.
street. I don't know how true these are that, oh, we have a few doses left. Is there any sort of procedure that is supposed to happen for, you know, the circumstance where there are doses left at the end of the day and people have gone through their appointments or is there a list of people who are supposed to be coming in the next day who can be quickly called? How does that work? There's all of that, <laughs> yes. Uh, we have been watching that very carefully, particularly with the, um, the vaccines that have a six-hour window that you need to use them, so Pfizer in particular. And yes, we have all of that. There's lists, there's pulling people in sooner for their appointments if we're getting to, and it's also how we manage the clinic, and that's one of the reasons why we're using the mass clinics that we have, because we can be very efficient in how we're using the vaccine. So who's drawing it up, making sure we can Get every six doses or more from each vial, making sure that uh, we have just enough drawn up and out of the freezer so that uh, it meets the needs of the patients as there are the people who are going to be immunized as they're coming through. And we have a plan for what to do at the end of the day. In some parts of the, of the province, that means that all of the extra doses are taken to the local emergency department. It means that sometimes if there's extra doses, people are called in early or other people are on the priority list. So um, there's no point hanging out inside of a clinic because uh, all of the doses at the end of the day are spoken for and we've been really, really good. We look at wastage in all of our immunization programs and this is one thing that uh, was uh, seized us quite early on in this, particularly when we were having very limited supplies. Um, so we have measures in place to to protect against uh, wastage uh, in all stages of how we plan the clinics, how the, the doses are drawn up, how many doses, how many vials are thawed at a time, etc. So yeah, there is a, a very detailed plan um, and it varies by where the immunization is happening. Um, but uh, so far we've done really well at not wasting doses and at getting maximum doses from every vial. We have time for one more question today. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a statement this afternoon with the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca. For updated province-wide restrictions, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID restrictions. And for information about the province's orders and pandemic supports, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question today is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Dr. Henry, can you elaborate more on what is behind the increase in younger people needing critical care? Uh, you mentioned more people in their 30s and 40s are being severely impacted from hospitalization to death. So what is the common denominator and why we're seeing this happen now? Yeah, I don't know that there's a common denominator. There are many different factors. Some of it's related to where some of the um, community clusters have been seen. Uh, we saw that with uh, some of the um, outbreaks that were happening in First Nations community where people at a younger age were more, much more likely to need hospitalization or critical care. And sadly, where we've seen uh, younger people die from the virus. Um, so it is partly that. It's partly the, the, the um, as we're protecting more older people, there's more transmission in that younger age group. And if you remember the last time we presented it, it's on the, the BC CDC website. What we're seeing is uh, increases again in the, the 20 um, to 39 year age group and up to age 59. So some of these are social transmissions. Some of them are community transmissions where people are in crowded households, for example. And then some of them are work related. So it, it is a matter of numbers with a higher number of people in that uh, age group being affected. The pr probability that somebody is going to end up in hospital uh, at a younger age goes up. Some of it is underlying illnesses and underlying risks in the population where we're seeing transmission. And um, up until quite recently, we, we were having ongoing challenges and outbreaks in um, shelters and in places like the downtown east side. And this is where the success that we've been seeing in, in pockets of, of communities with um, vaccination really hits home. Um, We've now seen a dramatic, three weeks after the, the push in the downtown east side, we've seen a, a dramatic drop off, which is the good news, which is why we all need to keep hanging on for this next little while. I had the privilege on the weekend of uh, having conversations with uh, counterparts uh, across the country, but with um, our counterparts in the UK, and they found the same thing 
that it, once we reach a certain level, we will see decreases in transmission. And from the AstraZeneca vaccine, which they're using quite extensively in the UK, they had exactly the same, if not better, response in the community. So these are the things that we need to focus on for getting through this next few few weeks in particular, and then we'll start to see the impact of the amount of vaccine that we've been able to provide in the last few weeks and into into April. So um, what we are seeing and is that it's because we still have fairly high numbers and the transmission is happening, um, but as older people are becoming protected, it is younger people that are more uh, being affected right now. Follow-up, Tanya? Yes, thanks. And if Mr. Minister Dix could give us an answer in French as well, that would be great. Thanks. Um, as we watch the race between the vaccines and the variants of concern, uh, which side is winning? A data scientist we spoke to says our vaccination rollout is not fast enough to catch the variants of concern at this point. And you mentioned it briefly earlier, but would you say we're now in our third wave? And, and what could we see change if the variants accelerate faster than the vaccinations? Yeah, so I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure who you're quoting, but uh, the, what I heard was not uh, so much that we're not immunizing fast enough. It's it's how we're targeting our immunization, and w w what we have not seen is necessarily is the variants driving transmission. We've, uh, which if you think about the UK or Ireland, where they saw uh, dramatic increases in numbers of cases and proportion of variants at the same time. What we're seeing is a slow but steady replacement of cases with the variants as the cases are absolutely continuing up. But it's been a gradual increase. So I, I I, I've never been a fan of the wave analogy, um, but you know we we had a very high peak in our second wave prior to immunization being available, and now we're at a at a high level, a level that keeps me awake at night for sure. Um, at a point where we are trying to target uh, where transmission in our community is happening. Um, as best we can with with the vaccines that we have available, and I, this is where having uh, this influx of the AstraZeneca vaccine gives us so much more flexibility to be able to do that. And I think it's going to make a huge difference in three weeks. So we need to keep um, paying attention to our COVID safety plans. We've been talking with our workplace uh, WorkSafe BC and our uh, environmental health officers who do all of the workplace inspections and follow-ups and monitoring. And we are um, we've been working with them over the last few weeks to really put. Um, those COVID safety plans front and center again and to remind people how important they are. Because if we can stop that transmission in those workplaces, that is also going to help us in this next period of time. And then I'm calling on all of us again to go back to our basics. This is not the time to be getting together even with a small group of friends. This is not the time to have that wedding. Put it off. Put it off to the summer and we will be in a different place, in a different post-pandemic place. We'll still be dealing with COVID, but we will be out of uh, the, the really challenging place that we are right now. So yes, we are seeing things increasing, um, whether it's you know, the, uh, the end of our second wave or the beginning of a third. It, it is worrisome and we have, at the same time, um, our two immunization programs to target those most at risk and to target um, hot spots in our community. And the next few weeks will tell um, how we're doing on that. Je pense que le Dr. Henry l'a dit bien. Il n'est pas un amateur d'idées des vagues et cela étant. C'est une période préoccupante actuellement et les, euh, les, euh, les variants de concern sont, font partie euh, de cela. Alors, aucun des gens qui sont morts euh, pendant le week-end, par exemple, euh, étaient des cas des, des variants de concern. Euh, il y a, euh, mais de, de plus en plus, ces variétés vont remplacer des cas normaux de COVID-19. C'est ce qu'on a vu uh, en Irlande, en Grande-Bretagne et dans d'autres uh, pays dans le monde. Et on, on va sans doute le voir ici en Colombie-Britannique. Mais cela étant, uh, il faut uh, que, ça pas, que ce, pas, ne, ce ne soit pas une concurrence entre les vaccins 
il est variété. Ça, il y a aussi l'élément des, des gens dans l'audience qui vont participer à cet effort en suivant des règles et des conseils de la santé publique. Ça, c'est essentiel maintenant. On a des vaccins, bien entendu, et on a des défis actuellement. On les voit dans les, le nombre de cas, on le voit dans le niveau de transmission. Et donc, force est de reconnaître, c'est qu'il faut agir maintenant pour réduire la transmission de COVID-19, euh, alors qu'on a une campagne de vaccin qui va nous aider dans les mois à venir. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you on Thursday. Thanks for joining us. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.